The Love Shown to Us by Jesus in His Passion Excerpts from the Writings of St. Alphonsus Liguri God so loved men that He gave His own Son to redeem them. St. Francis de Sales called Mount Calvary the Mountain of Lovers and says that the love which springs not from the Passion is weak, meaning that the Passion of Jesus Christ is the most powerful incentive to inflame us to love our Savior. To be able to comprehend a part, for to comprehend the whole is impossible, of the great love which God has shown us in the Passion of Jesus Christ, it is sufficient to glance at what is said of it in the Divine Scriptures, of which I shall here set forth some of the principal passages. Nor let any one complain that I thus repeat the text which I have already repeated several times in my other works when speaking of the Passion. Many writers of mischievous books constantly repeat their immodest jests in order that the, to more excite the passions of their thoughtless readers. And shall it not be permitted to me to repeat these holy texts which most inflame souls with divine love? Speaking of this love, Jesus himself said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The word so expresses much. It teaches us that when God gave his only begotten Son, he displayed to us a love which we can never attain to comprehend. Through sin we were all dead, having lost the life of grace. But the Eternal Father, in order to make known his goodness to the world and to show us how much he loved us, chose to send on earth his Son, that by his death he might restore to us the life we had lost. In this appeared the love of God to us, in that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live by him. Thus, in order to pardon us, God refused that pardon to his own Son, desiring that he should take upon him to satisfy the divine justice for all our faults. He spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. The words delivered up are used because God gave him into the hands of the executioners, that they might load him with insults and pains, until he died of agony on a shameful tree. Thus he first loaded him with all of our sins. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, and then he chose to see him consumed with the most bitter inward and outward pangs and afflictions. For the wickedness of my people I have stricken him. The Lord bruised him in infirmity. St. Paul, considering this love of God, goes on to say, on account of the too great love with which he loved us, when we were dead in sins, he raised us up in Christ. The Apostle calls it his too great love. Could there be anything indeed in excess in God? Yes. By this he means to us to understand that God has done such things for us, that if faith had not assured us of them, none could have believed them. And therefore the church cries out in astonishment, O oh, how wonderful is that which thy love towards us has thought fit to do! O oh, inestimable love of love, that thou mightest redeem thy servant! Thou hast delivered up thy son! Remark here the expression of the church, love of love, for the love of God to us is more than that he has shown to any other creature. God, being love itself, as St. John says, he loves all his creatures. Thou lovest all things that are, and hatest nothing that thou hast made. But the love that he bears to man seems to be that which is the dearest and most beloved to him, for it appears as though, in love, he hath preferred man to the angels, since he has been willing to die for men, and not for the fallen angels. The Son of God offered himself for the love of us. Speaking, then, of the love of the Son of God for man, let us remember that when he saw on one side man lost through sin, and on the other side the divine justice requiring a perfect satisfaction for the offenses committed by man, who was himself unable to offer such a satisfaction, he voluntarily offered himself to make satisfaction. He was offered because he willed it. 
and this humble lamb gave himself to the tortures, suffering them to lacerate his flesh and to lead him to death without lamenting or opening his mouth as it was foretold. He shall be brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is dumb before its shearers, and openeth not its mouth. St. Paul writes that Jesus Christ accepted the death of the cross to obey his Father, but let us not imagine that the Redeemer was crucified solely to obey his Father, and not without his own full will. He freely offered himself to this death, and of his own will chose to die for man, moved by the love he bore him. As he himself declares by St. John, I lay down my life, for no man will take it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And he said that it was the work of the good shepherd to give his life for his sheep. And why was this? What obligation was there on the shepherd to give his life for the sheep? He loved us and gave himself for us. This indeed our loving Redeemer himself declared when he said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me, thereby showing the kind of death that he would die upon the cross, as the evangelist himself explains it. He said this, signifying by what death he would die. On these words, St. John Chrysostom remarks that he draws them as it were from the hands of a tyrant, by his death he draws us from the hands of Lucifer, who, as a tyrant, keeps us enchained as his slaves to torment us after our death forever in hell. Miserable had we been if Jesus Christ had not died for us, we should have all been imprisoned in hell. For us who has deserved hell, it is a great motive to us to love Jesus Christ, to think that by his death, he hath delivered us from this hell by pouring forth his blood. Let us then, in passing, glance at the pains of hell, where at this hour are so many wretched souls. O oh, miserable beings! There they are sunk in a sea of fire, where they endure ceaseless agony, since in this fire they experience pains of all kinds. There they are given into the hands of devils, who full of fury, are busied only in tormenting these miserable condemned ones. There, still more than by fire and the other tortures, are they tormented by remorse of conscience in recollecting the sins of their life, which were the cause of their damnation. There they see the way of escape from this abyss of torments ever closed. There they find themselves forever excluded from the company of the saints, and from their country, heaven, for which they were created. But what most afflicts them and constitutes their hell is to see themselves abandoned by God and condemned to unable evermore to love him and to look upon themselves with hatred and madness. From this hell Jesus Christ has delivered us, redeeming us not with gold or any earthly thing, but by giving his own life and blood upon the cross. The kings of the earth send their subjects to die in war to preserve their own security. Jesus Christ chose himself to die in order to give safety to his creatures. Jesus died not only for us all, but for each one of us. Behold Jesus then, presented by the scribes and priests to Pilate as a malefactor, that he might judge him and condemn him to the death of the cross, and see how they follow him in order to see him condemned and crucified. O marvelous thing, cries St. Augustine, to see the judge judged, to see justice condemned, to see life dying. And for what cause were these marvels accomplished, except through the love which Jesus Christ bore to men? He loved us and gave himself for us. Oh, that these words of St. Paul were ever before our eyes. Truly then would every affection for earthly things depart from our heart, and we should think only of loving our Redeemer, reflecting that it was love which brought him to pour forth all his blood, to make for us a bath of salvation. He hath loved us, and wash us from our sins in his own blood. 
St. Bernardine of Siena says that Jesus Christ from the cross looked at every single sin of every one of us and offered his blood for every one of them. In a word, love brought the Lord of all to appear the most vile and low of all things upon the earth. O power of love, cries St. Bernard, the supreme God of all and made us the lowest of all. Who hath done this? Love, forgetting its dignity, powerful in its affection, love triumphs over divinity. Love hath done this, because, in order to make itself known to the Beloved, it hath brought forth the loving one to lay aside his dignity, and to do that alone which aids and pleases the Beloved. Therefore, St. Bernard said that God, who can be conquered by none, causes himself to be conquered by the love which he bore for men. We must further reflect that whatever Jesus Christ suffered in his passion, he suffered for each one of us individually, on which account St. Paul says, I live in the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself for me. And what the Apostle said, every one of us may say, Wherefore, St. Augustine writes that man was redeemed at such a price that he seems to be of equal value with God. The saint also goes on to say, Thou hast loved me, not as thyself, but more than thyself, since to deliver me from death thou hast been willing to die for me. But since Jesus could have saved us by a single drop of his blood, why did he pour it all forth in torments, even so as to die of mere agony upon the cross. Yes, says St. Bernard, what a drop might have done. He chose to do with a stream in order to show us the excessive love he bore us. He calls it excessive, as Moses and Elias on Mount Tabor called the passion of the Redeemer in excess, in excess of mercy and love. They spoke of his excess, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem, St. Augustine, speaking of the passion of our Lord, says that his mercy exceeded the debt of our sins. Thus, the value of the death of Jesus Christ being infinite, infinitely exceeded the satisfaction due by us for our sins to the divine justice. Truly had the Apostle cause to say, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what St. Paul says, we may all say, What greater glory can we have, our hope for in the world, than to see a God dying for love of us? O eternal God, I have dishonored thee by my sins, but Jesus, by making satisfaction for me by his death, has more than abundantly restored the honor due to thee. For the love of Jesus, then, have mercy upon me. And thou, my Redeemer, who has died for me in order to oblige me to love thee, grant that I may love thee. For, having despised thy grace and thy love, I had deserved to be condemned to be able to love thee no more. But, O oh my Jesus, give me every punishment but this, and therefore I pray thee, consign me not to hell, for in hell I cannot love thee. Cause me to love thee, and then chastise me as thou wilt. Deprive me of everything, but not of thyself. I accept every infirmity, every ignominy, every pain that thou willest me to suffer. It is enough that I love thee. Now I know, by the light thou hast given me, that thou art most worthy of love, and hast so much loved me. I trust to live no longer without loving thee. For the time lost I have loved creatures, and have turned my back upon thee, the infinite good. But now I say to thee, that I would love thee alone and nothing else. O my beloved Savior, if thou seest that at any future time I should cease to love thee, I pray thee to cause me first to die, and I shall be content to die before I am separated from thee. O Holy Virgin Mary, and Mother of God, help me with thy prayers, obtain for me that I may never cease to love my Jesus, who died for me and thee, my Queen, who has already obtained for me so many mercies. Amen.
the gratitude that we owe to Jesus Christ for his passion. Jesus died for us. We ought to live and die for him. St. Augustine says that Jesus Christ, having first given his life for us, has bound us to give our life for him, and, further, that when we go to the Eucharistic table to communicate, as we go to feed there upon the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we ought also, in gratitude, to prepare for him the offering of our blood and of our life, if there is need for us to give either of them for his glory. Full of tenderness are these words of St. Francis de Sales, as this text of St. Paul. The charity of Christ presseth us. To what does it press us? To love him. But let us hear what St. Francis de Sales says. When we know that Jesus has loved us even to death, and that the death of the cross, is not this to feel our hearts constrained by a violence as great as it is full of delight? And then he adds, My Jesus gives himself wholly to me, and I give myself wholly to him. I will live and die upon his breast, and neither death nor life shall ever separate me from him. St. Peter in order that we might remember to be ever grateful to our Savior, reminds us that we were not redeemed from the slavery of hell with gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, which he sacrificed for us as an innocent lamb upon the altar of the cross. Great, therefore, will be the punishment of those who are thankless for such a blessing if they do not correspond to it. It is true that Jesus came to save all men who were lost, but it is also true what was said by the venerable Simeon when Mary presented the child Jesus in the temple. Behold, this child is placed for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel, and as a sign which shall be spoken against. By the words for the rising again, he expresses the salvation which all believers should receive from Jesus Christ, who by faith shall rise from death to the life of grace, but first, by the words he has set for the fall, he foretells that many shall fall into a greater ruin by their ingratitude to the Son of God, who came into the world to become a contradiction to his enemies, as the following words imply. He shall be a sign which shall be spoken against. For Jesus Christ was set up as a sign, against which were hurled all the calumnies, the injuries, and the insults which the Jews devised against him. And this sign is spoken against not only by the Jews of the present day who deny him to be the Messiah, but by those Christians who ungratefully return his love with offenses and by neglecting his commands. Our Redeemer, says St. Paul, went so far as to give his life for us in order to make himself the Lord of all of our hearts, by displaying to us his love and dying for us. For this Christ both died and rose again, that he might be Lord of the dead and of the living. No, writes the Apostle, we are no longer our own, since we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Wherefore, if we do not love him and obey his precepts, of which the first is that we should love him, we are not only ungrateful, but unjust, and deserve a double punishment. The obligation of a slave rescued by Jesus Christ from the hands of the devil is to devote himself wholly to love and serve him, whether he live or die. St. John Chrysostom makes an excellent reflection upon the above-quoted text of St. Paul, saying that God has more care for us than we have for ourselves and therefore regards our life as his own riches, and our death as his own loss, so that if we die, we die not to ourselves, but also to God. Oh, how great is our glory while we live in this valley of tears, in the midst of so many dangers of perishing, that we should be able to say, We are the Lord's. We are his possession. He will take care to preserve us in his grace in this life, and to keep us with himself throughout eternity in the life that is to come. What is it to live and die for Jesus? 
Jesus Christ then died for every one of us in order that every one of us might live only to his Redeemer who died for love of him. Christ died for us all that both they who live should live no longer to themselves but to him who died for them and rose again. He that lives for himself directs all his desires, fears and pains and places all his happiness in himself. But he that lives to Jesus Christ places all his desires in loving and pleasing him. All his joys in gratifying him, all his fears are that he should displease him. He is only afflicted when he sees Jesus despised, and he only rejoices in seeing him loved by others. This is to live to Jesus Christ, and this is he justly claims for us all. To gain this he has bestowed all the pains which he suffered for love of us. Does he ask too much in this? No, says St. Gregory. He cannot ask too much, when he has given such tokens of his love to us, that he seems to have become a fool for our sake. Without reserve he has given himself wholly for us. He has, therefore, a right to require that we should give ourselves wholly to him, and should fix all our love upon him, and if we take him from any portion of it, by loving anything either apart from him or not for his sake, he has reason to complain of us, for when we do not love him as we should, says St. Augustine. And what but creatures can we love except Jesus Christ? And in comparison with Jesus Christ, what are creatures but worms of the earth, dust, smoke, and vanity? To St. Clement, Pope, was offered a heap of silver, gold, and gems if he would renounce Jesus Christ. The saint, however, gave only a sigh and then exclaimed, O oh my Jesus, thou infinite good, how dost thou endure to be esteemed by men as less than the rubbish of this earth? No, says St. Bernard, it was not rashness which made the martyrs encounter hot irons, nails, and the most cruel deaths. It was the love of Jesus Christ when they saw him dead upon the cross. For us all the example of St. Mark and St. Marcillian is of value, who, when they were fastened with nails through their hands and feet, were rebuked by the tyrants as fools for suffering so cruel a torment rather than renounce Jesus Christ. While they replied that they had never known greater delights than they had now experienced when transfixed with these nails. And all saints, in order to give pleasure to Jesus Christ, who was thus tormented and despised for our sake, gladly embraced poverty, persecutions, contempt, infirmities, pains, and death. Souls betrothed to Jesus Christ upon the cross know nothing more glorious to them than to bear the signs of the crucified, which are his sufferings. Let us hear what St. Augustine says to us. To you it is not lawful to love a little. Let him who has wholly fixed upon the cross for you be wholly fixed in your hearts. Let us, therefore, unite ourselves wholly to St. Paul and say with him, I am crucified with Christ. I live, and yet not I, for Christ liveth in me, who loved me and gave himself for me. On this St. Bernard remarks, it is as if he said, To all other things I am dead, I have no sensation, I pay no regard, but the things which are of Christ. These find me a living man, and prepared to act upon them. Therefore St. Paul says, To me to live is Christ. Meaning by these words, Jesus Christ is my love. It is a sure promise, if we are dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. The kings of the earth, after a victory over their enemies, confer a part of all that is gained upon those who have fought on their side. Thus does Jesus Christ on the day of judgment. He gives a share of the blessings of heaven to all who have toiled and suffered for his glory. The apostle says, If we are dead with him, we shall also live with him. To die with Christ means the denial of ourselves, that is, of our own inclinations which, if we do not deny, we shall come to deny Jesus Christ, 
who will justly deny us on the day of account. And there we must remark that we not only deny Jesus Christ when we deny the faith, but also when we refuse to obey him in anything he desires of us, as, for example, when, for love of him, we will not forgive an injury we have received, when we give way to the love of vain honor, when we will not break through a friendship which imperils the friendship of Jesus Christ, or yield to the fear of being counted ungrateful, while our first gratitude is due to Jesus Christ, who has given his blood and life for us, which no creature, whatever, has done for us. O oh man, look at this cross of the Son of God, who as an innocent lamb sacrifices himself to pay for thy sins, and thus to gain thy love. Look at him, look at him and love him. O oh my Jesus, O oh infinitely lovely, grant that I may no longer live ungrateful to so great a good, for the past I have lived in forgetfulness of thy love and of all thou hast suffered for me, but henceforth I would think of nothing but loving thee. O wounds of Jesus, stricken with love, O blood of Jesus, inebriated with love, O death of Jesus, cause me to die every love which is not love for him. O Jesus, I love thee above everything, I love thee with all my soul, I love thee more than myself. I love thee, and because I love thee, I would die of grief because I have so often turned my back upon thee, and have despised thy grace. By thy merits, O my crucified Savior, give me thy love, and make me all thine own. O Mary, my hope, make me love Jesus Christ, and I ask nothing more. We must place all our hopes in the merits of Jesus Christ. Jesus crucified is our only hope in all our wants. There is no salvation in any other, St. Peter says, that all our salvation is in Jesus Christ, who, by the means of the cross, where he sacrificed his life for us, opened us a way for hoping for every blessing from God, if we would be faithful to his commands. Let us hear what St. John Chrysostom says of the cross. Quote, the cross is the hope of Christians, the staff of the lame, the comfort of the poor, the destruction of the proud, the victory over the devils, the guide of youth, the rudder of sailors, the refuge of those who are in danger, the counselor of the just, the rest of the afflicted, the physician of the sick, the glory of the martyrs. End quote. The cross, that is, Jesus crucified is, the hope of the faithful, because if we had not Jesus Christ, we should have no hope of salvation. It is the staff of the lame, because we are all lame in our present state of corruption. We should have no strength to walk in the way of salvation except that which is communicated to us by the grace of Jesus Christ. It is the comfort of the poor, which we all are, for all we have, we have from Jesus Christ. It is the destruction of the proud, for the followers of the crucified cannot be proud, seeing him dead as a malefactor upon the cross. It is the victory over the devils, for the very sign of the cross is sufficient to drive them from us. It is the instructor of the young, for admirable is the teaching which they who are beginning to walk in the ways of God learn from the cross. It is the rudder of mariners, and guides us through the storms of this present life. It is the refuge of those in danger, for they who are in the peril of perishing through temptations of strong passions find a secure harbor by flying to the cross. It is the counselor of the just, for how many saints learn wisdom from the cross, that is, from the troubles of this life. It is the rest of the afflicted, for where can they find greater relief than in contemplating the cross on which a God suffers for love of them? It is the physician of the sick, for when they embrace it, they are healed of the wounds of the soul. It is the glory of the martyrs, for to be made like Jesus Christ, the King of martyrs, is the greatest glory they can possess. In a word, all our hopes are placed in the merits of Jesus Christ. The Apostle says, quote, I know how to be humbled, and I know how to abound, how to be satisfied, and how to hunger, how to abound, 
and how to suffer poverty, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. End quote. Thus, St. Paul, instructed by the Lord, says, I know how I ought to conduct myself. When God humbles me, I resign myself to his will. When he exalts me, to, to him I give all the honor. When he gives me abundance, I thank him. When he makes me endure poverty, still I bless him. And I do all this not by my own strength, but by the strength of the grace which God gives me. For he that trusts in Jesus Christ is strengthened with invincible power. The Lord, says St. Bernard, makes those who hope in him all-powerful. The saint also adds that a soul which does not presume upon its own strength, but is strengthened by the word, can govern itself, so that no evil shall have power over it, and that no force, no fraud, no snare can cast it down. The apostle prayed thrice to God that the impure temptations which he troubled him might be driven away, and he was answered, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is accomplished in weakness. How is it that the virtue of perfection consists in weakness? St. Thomas, with St. Chrysostom, explain it, that the greater our weakness and inclination to evil, the greater is the strength given us by God. Therefore St. Paul himself says, I will gladly therefore glory in my infirmities, that the strength of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in insults, in necessities, in persecutions, in straits for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For the word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to those who are saved it is the power of God. Thus St. Paul warns us not to follow after worldly men, who place their trust in riches, in their relatives and friends in the world, and account the saints fools for despising those earthly helps. Yet men ought to place all their hopes in the love of the cross, that is, of Jesus crucified, who gives every blessing to those who trust in him. We must further remark that the power and the strength of the world is altogether different from that of God. It is exercised in worldly riches and honors, but the latter in humility and endurance. Wherefore, St. Augustine says that our strength lies in knowing that we are weak and in humbly confessing what we are. And St. Jerome says that this is one thing constitutes the perfection of the present life, that we should know that we are imperfect. For then we distrust our own strength and abandon ourselves to God, who protects and saves those who trust in him. He is the protector of all those who hope in him, says David. Those savest those who hope in thee. He that trusts in the Lord is like the Mount Sion, which is never removed. Therefore St. Augustine reminds us that, when we are tempted, we must hasten and abandon ourselves in Jesus Christ, who will not suffer us to fall, but will embrace and hold us up, and thus remedy our weakness. When Jesus Christ took upon himself the weaknesses of humanity, he merited for us a strength which conquers our weakness. For in that he himself hath suffered and hath been tempted, he is powerful to help those who are tempted. How is this that the Savior in being himself tempted became able to strengthen us in our temptations? It is meant that Jesus Christ, by being afflicted by temptations, became more ready to feel for us and help us when we are tempted. To this corresponds that other text of the same apostle. We have not a high priest who cannot feel compassion for our infirmities, but was in all things tempted like us, though without sin. Therefore, let us go with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the help we need. Jesus himself, in enduring fears, weariness, and sorrows, as the evangelists bear witness, speaking especially of the afflictions that he endured in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he suffered, has merited for us a courage to resist the threats of those who would not corrupt us, a strength to overcome the weariness we experience in prayer, in mortifications, and in other devout exercises, and a power of enduring with peace of mind 
that sadness which afflicts us in adversity. We must also know that he himself in the garden, at the sight of all the pains and the desolate death that he was about to endure, chose to suffer this human weakness. The spirit indeed is ready, but the flesh is weak. And he prayed to his divine father that, if it were possible, the cup might pass from him. But immediately he added, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And for the whole time that he continued praying in the garden, he repeated the same prayer, Thy will be done. And the third time he prayed, saying the same thing, with those words, Thy will be done. Jesus Christ merited and obtained for us resignation in all adversity, and gained for his martyrs and confessors a strength to resist all the persecutions and torments of tyrants. This world, says St. Leo, inflamed all the confessors, it crowned all the martyrs. Thus also by the horror that he experienced through our sins, which caused him to fall into a bitter agony in the garden, he merited for us contrition for our sins. By the abandonment by the Father which he suffered on the cross, he merited for us strength to retain our courage in all desolations and darkness of spirit. By bowing his head in death upon the cross, in obedience to the will of the Father, he merited for us all the victories which we gain over passions and temptations, and patience in the pains of life, and especially in the bitterness and straits which we endure in death. In a word, St. Leo writes that Jesus Christ came to take our infirmities and distresses in order to communicate to us his strength and constancy. St. Paul says that though he was the Son of God, he learned obedience in the things that he suffered, from which we are to understand not that Jesus in his passion learned the virtue of obedience and did not know it beforehand, but, as St. Anselm says, he learned not only by the knowledge which he had before, but by actual experience, how grievous was the death he endured in order to obey his Father. And at the same time, he experienced how great is the merit of obedience, for by which he obtained for himself the utmost height of glory, which is the seat at the Father's right hand and eternal salvation for us. Therefore, the Apostle adds, being perfected, he became the cause of eternal life to all them that obey him. He says, being perfected, because having completely fulfilled all obedience, by suffering patiently what he endured in his passion, Jesus Christ became the cause of eternal life to all those who obediently suffer with patience the troubles of this present life. By this patience of Jesus Christ, the holy martyrs were animated and strengthened to embrace with patience the most cruel torments that the cruelty of tyrants could devise, and not only with patience, but with joy and desire to suffer for the love of Jesus Christ. In the celebrated letter which St. Ignatius the martyr wrote to the Romans after he had been condemned to be thrown to the wild beasts, and before he went to the place of his martyrdom, we read, quote, Suffer me, my children, to be ground down by the teeth of the wild beasts, that I may become corn for my Redeemer. I seek only him who has died for me. He who is the only object of my love was crucified for me, and the love I bear to him makes me desire to be crucified for him. End quote. St. Leo writes of St. Lawrence the martyr that when he lay upon the gridiron, the flames which burned him without were less hot than the fire that burned within him. Eusebius and Palladius relate of St. Potmina, a virgin of Alexandria, that when she was condemned to be thrown into a cauldron of boiling, boiling pitch, that she might suffer the more for the love of her crucified spouse. She prayed the tyrant to have her thrust in, little by little, that her death might become more torturing, and she had desire, for they began by thrusting her feet into the pitch, so that she was for three hours in this torment, and did not die till the pitch reached her neck. 
Such was the patience, such the fortitude which the martyrs gained from the passion of Jesus Christ. It was this courage which the crucified infuses into those who love him that made St. Paul say, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or hunger, or nakedness, or perils, or persecution, or the sword? And at the same time he says, In all these things we are conquerors through him who loved us. The love of the martyrs for Jesus Christ was unconquerable because it gained its strength from him who is unconquerable, who strengthened them to suffer. And let us not imagine that the torments of the martyrs were miraculously deprived of their power of torturing or that their heavenly consolations lulled the pains of the torments. This perhaps may sometimes have happened, but ordinarily they truly felt all their pains and many through weakness yielded to the pangs, so that in the case of those who were constant in suffering, their patience was entirely the gift of God, who gave them their strength. The first object of our hopes is eternal blessedness, that is, the blessedness of God, the fruition of God, as St. Thomas teaches. And all the means which are necessary for obtaining this salvation which consists in the enjoyment of God, such as the pardon of our sins, final perseverance in divine grace, and a good death, we must hope for, not from our own strength, nor our good resolutions, but solely from the merits and grace of Jesus Christ. That our confidence, therefore, may be firm, let us believe with infallible certainty that we must look for the accomplishment of all these means of salvation only from the merits of Jesus Christ. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ that he will pardon our sins. And first, in speaking of the pardon of sins, we must remember that for this very end our Redeemer came upon earth, that he might pardon sinners. The Son of Man came to save that which was lost. Therefore, the Baptist, when he showed to the Jews that their Messiah was already come, said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And it was foretold by Isaiah, As a sheep before his shearers, he shall be dumb. And also by Jeremiah, I am as a lamb that is carried to be a victim. And first, he was foreshadowed by Moses in the Paschal Lamb, and by the sacrifice of a lamb to God under the law every morning, and by every other evening sacrifices. All these lambs, however, could not take away a single sin. They served only to represent the sacrifice of the divine Lamb, Jesus Christ, who with his blood would wash our souls, and thus free them both from the stain of sin and from the eternal punishment of sin. For this is implied by the words, Take away, taking upon himself the duty of satisfying the divine justice for us by his death, according to what Isaiah wrote, The Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Wherefore, St. Cyril writes, One is slain for all, and the whole human race is restored to God the Father. By dying, Jesus desired to regain for God all mankind who were lost. Oh, how great is the debt we owe to Jesus Christ! If a criminal condemned to death were already standing at the gibbet with the rope around his neck, and a friend were to come and take the rope and bind it around himself and die in the place of the guilty man, how great would be his obligation to love him! This is what Jesus Christ has done. He has been willing to die on the cross to deliver us from eternal death. Jesus bore our sins, says St. Peter, in his body on the tree, that being dead to sin, we might live to justice, by whose stripes we were healed. What could be more wonderful, cries St. Bonaventura, than that wounds should heal and death give life? St. Paul says that God has graced us in his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the remission of sins, according to the riches of his grace, 
which have superabounded in us. And this resulted from the covenant made by Jesus Christ with his divine Father, that he would pardon us our offenses and receive us into his favor for the sake of the passion and the death of his Son. And in this sense the Apostle called Jesus Christ the mediator of the New Testament. In the Holy Scriptures, the word testament has two senses, that of a covenant or an agreement between two parties formally disagreed, and that of a promise or disposition by will by which the testator leaves an inheritance to his heirs, and this testament is not valid until the testator's death. We have formally spoken of the testament as a promise. We now speak of it as a covenant, in the sense in which the apostle uses it when he calls Jesus Christ the mediator of the New Testament. Man, by reason of his sin, was a debtor to the divine justice and an enemy of God. The Son of God came on earth and took man's flesh, and thus, being God and man, he became a mediator between God and man acting on behalf of both, and in order that he might bring about peace between them and obtain for man the divine grace he offered himself to pay with his blood and his death the debt due by man. This was the reconciliation prefigured in the Old Testament by all the sacrifices and symbols ordained by God, such as the tabernacle, the altar, the veil, the candlestick, the censer, the ark, wherein were contained the rod and the tables of the law. All these things were signs and figures of the promised redemption, and because this redemption was to be accomplished by the blood of Jesus Christ, therefore God appointed that all the sacrifices should be offered with the pouring forth of the blood of the animals, which was a figure of the blood of the Lamb of God, while all the instruments above named were sprinkled with the blood. Wherefore, not even the Old Testament was dedicated without blood. St. Paul says that the First Testament, that is, the First Alliance, Covenant, or Mediation, which was accomplished by the Old Law and which prefigured the mediation of Jesus Christ under the Old Law, was celebrated with the blood of goats and calves, and that with this blood were sprinkled the book, the people, the tabernacle, and all the sacred vessels. When the commandment of the law of Moses was read to all the people, the priest taking the blood of calves and goats with water and with sacred wool. The sacred wool signified Jesus Christ, for as wool is by nature white and becomes red by being dyed, thus Jesus, who was white by nature and innocence, appeared on the cross all red with blood, being condemned as a malefactor and thus fulfilled in himself the words of the spouse in the canticles, My beloved is white and is ruddy, and with hyssop, a lowly herb which expressed the humility of Jesus Christ, sprinkled with the book and all the people saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded, and in like manner he sprinkled the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministration with blood. For all these things are purged with blood, according to the law, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. The apostle repeats the word blood several times in order to fix in the hearts of the Jews and of all men that without the blood of Jesus Christ we have no hope of pardon for our sins, as then, in the old law, by the blood of the victims, the outward defilement of sin was taken away, and the temporal punishment due to them was remitted, so, in the new law, the blood of Jesus Christ washes away the inward stain of sin, and according to St. John's words, he loved us and washed us with his own blood. St. Paul thus explains the whole truth in the same chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. Christ being a high priest of coming good things by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, neither by the blood of goats, but by his own blood, entered once into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption. The high priest entered by the tabernacle into the holy of holies, and by sprinkling the blood of animals, purged sinners from their outward defilement and from temporal punishment. For in order to the pardon of the sin, 
and for their liberation from eternal punishment, contrition, faith, and hope in the coming Messiah who was about to die to obtain pardon for them were absolutely necessary for the Jews. Jesus Christ, on the other hand, by means of his own body, which was greater and more perfect tabernacle spoken by the apostles, which was sacrificed on the cross, entered into the Holy of Holies of Heaven, which was closed to us, and opened it to us by means of this redemption. Therefore St. Paul, in order to encourage us to hope for the pardon of all our sins by trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ, goes on to say, If the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on the unclean sanctifies to the purification of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who, by the Holy Spirit, offered himself without stain to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This he says because Jesus offered himself to God without shadow of sin, for otherwise he would have not been a worthy mediator, fit to reconcile God with sinful man, nor would his blood have had virtue to purge our consciences from dead works, that is, from sins, from works without merits, and deserving of eternal punishment. To serve the living God, God pardons us for no other end than that for the rest of our life we should devote it wholly to loving and serving Him. Finally, the Apostle concludes, Therefore, He is the mediator of the new covenant. Because our Redeemer, through the boundless love He bore us, was willing by the price of His blood to deliver us from eternal death, therefore, he obtained for us from God pardon, grace, and eternal blessedness. If we are faithful to love him until death, this was the mediation or covenant accomplished by Jesus Christ and God by the terms of which pardon and salvation are promised us. This promise of pardon for our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ was confirmed to us by Jesus himself the day before his death, when, Leaving to us the sacrament of the Eucharist, he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which shall be poured forth for many for the remission of sins. He says, Poured forth, because in the sacrifice which was at hand, he was about to shed not only a part, but the whole of his blood, to satisfy for our sins and obtain pardon for us. Therefore he desired that the sacrifice should be renewed every day at every Mass that is celebrated, in order that his blood might continually plead in our favor, and therefore he is called a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Thou art our priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Aaron offered sacrifices of animals, but Melchizedek offered bread and wine, which was a figure of the sacrifice of the altar in which our Savior, under the species of bread and wine, offered at his last supper his body and blood to God, as he was about to sacrifice it on the following day in his passion, and which he constantly offered by the hands of his priests, renewing by them the sacrifice of the cross. Therefore, David called Jesus Christ an eternal priest, as St. Paul explains it, saying, He that remaineth forever hath an eternal priesthood, the ancient priests came to an end by their death, but Jesus, being eternal, has an eternal priesthood. But how does he exercise his priesthood in heaven? The apostle explains this, adding, Wherefore, he is able to save forever those whom come to God by him, ever living to intercede for us. The great sacrifice of the cross, represented still in that of the altar, has power forever to save those who, by means of Jesus Christ, being rightly prepared by faith and good works, approach to God, and this sacrifice, as St. Ambrose and St. Augustine write, Jesus, as man, continues to offer to the Father for our benefit, performing there, as he did on earth, the office of our advocate and mediator, and also of our priest, which is to intercede for us. St. John Chrysostom says that the wounds of Jesus Christ are so many mouths which continually implore from God pardon for us sinners. Oh, how much better, says St. Paul, does the blood of Jesus Christ plead for us 
in calling down the divine mercy than the blood of Abel, which called for vengeance against Cain. In the revelations of St. Mary Magdalene of Pazzi, it is recorded that one day God spoke to her as follows, My justice is changed into mercy through the vengeance that was taken upon the innocent flesh of Jesus Christ. The blood of my son does not call for vengeance like the blood of Abel, but for mercy, and at this voice my justice is necessarily appeased. The blood binds my hands so that they cannot move to take that revenge upon sins which they would otherwise have taken. St. Augustine writes that God has promised us the remission of our sins and eternal life, but he has done more than he promised. To give us pardon and paradise cost Jesus Christ nothing, but to redeem us cost him his blood and his life. The Apostle St. John exhorts us to flee from sin, and, in order that we may not despair of pardon for the sins we have committed, if we have a firm resolution not to commit them again, he gives us courage to hope for pardon, saying that we have to do with Jesus Christ, who not only died to pardon us, but since his death to become our advocate with the Divine Father. To our sins were due disgrace with God and eternal damnation, but the passion of our Savior has acquired for us grace and eternal salvation, and justice itself requires this, since, on account of his merits, the Eternal Father has promised to pardon and save us. If we are only disposed to receive his grace and to obey his commands, as St. Paul writes, being made perfect, he is the cause of eternal salvation to all that obey him. Wherefore, the Apostle exhorts us to run with patience the race that is before us, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was before him, endured the cross and despised shame. O precious blood, thou art my hope. O blood of the innocent one, wash the stains of the guilty. O my Jesus, my foes having betrayed me into offending thee, now tell me that I have no more hope of salvation in thee. Many say unto my soul, There is no salvation for him in his God. But I trust in thy blood that thou hast shed for me. I will say with David, Thou, O Lord, wilt lift me up. My foes terrify me, and say that if I go to thee after so many sins, thou wilt drive me from thee. But I read in St. John thy promise, that him who cometh to thee thou wilt not cast out. To thee, therefore, I come full of confidence. We pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Thou, O my Savior, who hast poured forth all thy blood in such agonies, and with such love, that thou mightest not see me perish, do thou have mercy on me, pardon me, and save me. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ that he will grant us final perseverance. To obtain perseverance in good, we must not trust in our resolutions and in the promises we have made to God. If we trust in our own strength, we are lost. All our hope of preserving the grace of God must be placed in the merits of Jesus Christ, and thus, trusting in his help, we shall persevere till death, though we were attacked by all our enemies in earth and hell. Sometimes we find ourselves so cast down in mind and so assaulted by temptations that we seem almost lost. Let us not then lose courage, nor abandon ourselves to despair. Let us go to the crucified, and he will hold us up. The Lord permits his saints sometimes to find themselves in tempests and fears. St. Paul says that the afflictions and terrors which he suffered in Asia were so overpowering that he became weary of life, meaning that he was so, so far as he depended on his own strength in order to teach us that God, from time to time, leaves us in desolations in order that we may know our misery, and, distrusting ourselves, may humbly have recourse to his goodness and gain from him strength not to fall. More clearly he expresses the same in another place. We are cast down, but we perish not. We find ourselves oppressed with sadness and passions, 
but do not abandon ourselves to despair. We are tossed about on the water, but do not sink, because the Lord, by his grace, gives us strength against our enemies. But the apostle exhorts us ever to bear before our eyes that we are weak, and prone to lose the treasure of divine grace, and that all our strength for persevering it comes not from ourselves but from God. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the loftiness of the power may be of God, and not of ourselves. Let us then be firmly persuaded that in this life we must ever be aware of placing any confidence in our own works. Our strongest armor with which we shall ever win the victory over the assaults of hell is prayer. This is the armor of God which St. Paul speaks. Put on the armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the deceits of the devil. For our wrestling is not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spirits of wickedness in high places. Therefore, take on to you the armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day and to stand in all things perfect. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of justice and your feet showed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In all things taking the shield of faith, wherewith you may be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the most wicked one, and take on to you the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, by all prayer and supplication, praying at all times in the Spirit. Let us pause and weigh well these various expressions. Stand having your loins girt about with truth. There the apostle alludes to the military girdle with which soldiers gird themselves as a token of the fidelity which they sworn to their sovereign. The girdle which the Christian must put on is the possession of the truth of the doctrines of Jesus Christ, in accordance with which we must repress all inordinate passions, especially those of impurity which are the most dangerous of all. Having on the breastplate of justice, the Christian's breastplate is a good life, without which he will have little strength to resist the assaults of his foes, and your feet showed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The military shoes with which Christians ought to wear, in order that he may go speedily where it is necessary, unlike those feet are bare and who walk slowly, is the possession of a mind prepared to embrace and practice and to teach by example the holy maxims of the gospel. In all things taking the shield of faith, the shield with which the soldier of Christ must defend himself against the fiery darts, that is, darts which pierce like fire, of the enemy is a steady faith, strengthened with holy hope and especially with divine charity. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. The helmet, as St. Anselm teaches us, is the hope of eternal salvation. And lastly, the sword of the Spirit, our spiritual sword, is the divine word by which God repeatedly promises to hear those who pray to him. Seek, and it shall be given you. He that seeketh receiveth. Call to me, and I will hear thee. Call me, and I will deliver thee. Wherefore the Apostle continues, By all prayer and supplication, praying at all times in the Spirit, and in the same watching with all instance, and supplication for all the saints. Thus, prayer is the most powerful of the arms with which the Lord gives us victory over our evil passions and the temptations of hell. But this prayer must be made in the Spirit, that is, not with the mouth only, but with the heart. Moreover, it must last through our life, at all times, for as the struggle endures, so must our prayers. It must be urgent and repeated. If the temptation does not yield at the first prayer, we must repeat it a second, third, or fourth time, and if it still continues, we must add sighs, tears, importunity, vehemence, and even if we would do violence to God, that he may give us the grace of victory. This is what the Apostle words, with all instance and supplication, means. The Apostle adds, for all saints, 
which means that we are not to pray for ourselves alone, but for the perseverance of all the faithful who are in the grace of God, and especially of the priests, that they may labor for the conversion of unbelievers and all sinners, repeating in our prayers the words of Zacharias, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. It is of great use for resisting our enemies in spiritual combats, to anticipate them in our meditations by preparing ourselves to do violence to them to our utmost power, on our occasions when they may be suddenly come upon us, on all occasions when they may be suddenly come upon us. Thus the saints have been able to persevere in the greatest mildness, or at least, not to reply by a single word, and not to be disturbed when they have received a great injury, a violent persecution, a severe pang in body or in mind, the loss of property of great value, the death of a much-loved relative. Such victories are ordinarily not acquired without the aid of a life of long discipline, without frequenting the sacraments, and a continual exercise of meditation, spiritual reading, and prayer. Therefore, these victories are with difficulty obtained by those who have not taken great heed to avoid dangerous occasions, or who are attached to the vanities or pleasures of the world, and practice very little mortification of the senses, by those, in a word, who live a soft and easy life. St. Augustine says that in the spiritual life, first pleasures are to be conquered, then pains meaning that a person who is given to seek the pleasures of the senses will scarcely resist a great passion or temptation which assails him. A man who loves too much the esteem of the world will scarcely endure a grave affront without losing the grace of God. It is true that we must look for all our strength to live without sin and to do good works not from ourselves but from the grace of Jesus Christ. But we must take great care not to make ourselves weaker than we are by nature through our own fault. The defects of which we take no account will cause the divine light to fail, and the devil will become stronger against us. For example, a desire to display to the world our learning, rank, or vanity in dress, or the seeking of some superfluous pleasure or resentment at every inattentive word or action, or a wish to please everyone though at the loss of our spiritual profit, or neglect of works of piety through the fear of man, or little acts of disobedience towards our superiors, little murmurings, trifling but cherished aversions, trivial falsehoods, slight attacks upon our neighbor, loss of time in gossip, or the indulgence of curiosity. In a word, every attachment to earthly things and every act of inordinate self-love can serve as a help to our enemy to drag us over some precipice, or at least this defect deliberately consented to will deprive us of that abundance of divine help without which we may find ourselves fallen into ruin. We grieve when we find ourselves so dry in spirit and desolate in prayer, in communions, and in all our devout exercises. But how can God make us enjoy His presence and loving visits while we are thus niggardly and inattentive to him. He that so sparingly shall reap also sparingly. If we cause him so much displeasure, how can we expect to enjoy his heavenly consolations? If we do not detach ourselves in everything from earth, we shall never wholly belong to Jesus Christ. And where shall we go to protect ourselves? Jesus, by his humility, merited for us the grace of conquering pride, by his poverty, he merited us strength for us to despise earthly goods, and by his patience, constancy in overcoming slights and injuries. What pride, writes St. Augustine, could have been healed if not healed by the humility of the Son of God? What avarice, except by the poverty of Christ? What anger, except by the Savior's patience? But if we are cold in the love of Jesus Christ, and neglect to pray continually to him to help us, and nourish in our hearts any earthly affection, with difficulty shall we persevere in a good life. Let us pray, let us pray always, with prayer we shall obtain everything. O Savior of the world, O my only hope, 
by the merits of thy passion, deliver from me every impure desire which may hinder me from loving thee as I ought. May I be stripped of all desires that savor of the world. Grant that the only object of my desires may be thyself, who art the sovereign good, and the only good that is worthy of love. By thy sacred wounds, heal my infirmities. Give me grace to keep far from my heart every love which is not for thee, who deservest all my love. O Jesus, my love, thou art my hope. O sweet words, sweet consolation, Jesus, my love, thou art my hope. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that he will grant us eternal happiness. And therefore, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of his death, they that are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Here St. Paul speaks of the New Testament, not as a covenant, but as a promise, or testamentary disposition, by which Jesus Christ left us heirs of the kingdom of heaven. And because a testament is not in force until the death of the testator, therefore it was necessary that Jesus Christ should die, that we may become his heirs, and enter into the possession of paradise. Wherefore the apostle adds, For where there is a testament, the death of the testator must of necessity come in, for a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is as yet of no strength whilst the testator liveth. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Mediator, we have received grace in baptism to become the sons of God. Unlike the Jews, who, under the old covenant, though they were the elect, were yet all servants, whence the apostle writes, For there are two covenants, of which one on Mount Sinai engendereth to bondage. The first mediation was made with God by Moses on Mount Sinai, when God, through Moses, promised to the Jews the abundance of temporal blessings, if they observed the laws which he gave them. But this mediation, says St. Paul, only produced servants, unlike the mediation of Jesus Christ, which produces sons. We, brethren, like Isaac, are the children of promise. If, then, being Christians, we are the sons of God, by consequence, says the apostle, we are also heirs, for a portion of the Father's inheritance is given to all sons, and this is the inheritance of eternal glory in paradise, which Jesus Christ has merited for us by his death. St. Paul nevertheless adds, in the same place, if we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified with him. It is true that by our sonship to God, which Jesus Christ has obtained for us by his death, we have acquired a right to paradise. But this is on the supposition that we are faithful to correspond to the divine grace by our good works, and especially by holy patience. Therefore, the Apostle says that in order to obtain eternal glory, as Jesus Christ has obtained it, we must suffer upon earth as Jesus Christ suffered. He goes before, as our captain, with his cross. Under this standard we must follow him, each bearing his own cross, as that same Lord admonished us. He that will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. St. Paul also exhorts us to suffer with courage, strengthened by the hope of paradise, reminding us that the glory which will be given to us in the next life will be infinitely greater than all our sufferings, if we suffer here with good will, in order to fulfill the divine pleasure. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that shall be revealed in us. What beggar would be so foolish as not to give gladly all his rags for a great kingdom? We do not as yet enjoy this glory, because we are not yet saved, not having finished our life in the grace of God. But hope in the merits of Jesus Christ, says St. Paul, will save us. We are saved by hope. He will not fail to give us every help to save us if we are faithful to him and continue to pray, and the promise of Jesus Christ assures us that he hears every one who prays. Every one that seeketh, receiveth. Some will say, I fear. 
not that God will refuse to hear me if I pray to him, but I fear for myself that I should not know how to pray as I ought. No, says St. Paul, fear not this, for when we pray, God himself aids our weakness and makes us pray so as to be heard. The Spirit helpeth our infirmity and asketh for us. He asks, explains St. Austin, that is, he helps us to ask. The Apostle would still further increase our confidence, he says. We know that all things work together for good for those that love God. By this he teaches us that shame, sickness, poverty, persecutions are not evils, as men of the world account them, for God turns them all into blessings and glory for those who suffer with patience. Finally, he says, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. With these words he would persuade us that, if we should be saved, we must resolve to suffer everything rather than lose the divine grace, for no one can be admitted to the glory of the blessed unless at the day of judgment his life be found conformed to the life of Jesus Christ. And that sinners may not, through these words, abandon themselves to despair on account of their guilt, St. Paul encourages them to hope for pardon, telling them that, for this end, the Eternal Father has not spared his own Son, who was offered to satisfy for our sins, but gave him up to death, that he might pardon us sinners, and still further to increase the hope of penitent sinners, he says, Who is he that shall condemn? Is it Jesus Christ who died? As though he said, Sinners, you who detest your sins, why do you fear to be condemned to hell? Tell me who is your judge, who is to condemn you? Is it not Jesus Christ? How then can you fear that you will be condemned to death by this loving Redeemer, who, that he might not condemn you, has been willing to condemn himself to die as a malefactor upon the infamous gibbet of the cross? He speaks indeed of those sinners who, being contrite, have washed their souls in the blood of the Lamb, according to the words of St. John. O oh my Jesus, if I look at my sins, I am ashamed to seek for paradise, after the many times that I have openly renounced thee, for the sake of short and miserable pleasures. But looking to thee upon this cross, I cannot cease to hope for paradise, knowing that thou hast been willing to die upon this tree to atone for my sins and to obtain for me this paradise which I have despised. O oh, my sweet Redeemer, I hope through the merits of thy death that thou hast already pardoned me the sins I have committed against thee, for which I repent, and now I would rather die for grief of them. And yet, O oh, my God, I see that with all that thou hast pardoned me, it will ever be true that in my ingratitude I have had the heart to cause thee so much displeasure, who hast so loved me. But what is past is past. At least for the rest of my life, O oh my Lord, I would love thee with all my powers. I would live only for thee. I would be wholly thine. Holy, holy, holy thine. But thou must accomplish this. Detach me from every earthly thing, and give me light and strength to seek thee alone, my only good, my love, and my all. O Mary, hope of sinners, thou must help me with thy prayers. Pray, pray for me, and cease not to pray, until thou seest me wholly given to God. Amen. This has been a production of Alleluia Audiobooks. To listen to more Catholic audiobooks, homilies, and spiritual conferences, please visit us at alleluiaaudiobooks.com or Google Alleluia Audiobooks. This CD is free to make copies of to distribute, but we do ask that no alterations are made to the original. Thank you for listening, and God bless.